Hello, students. Ladies and gentlemen, this week we are delving into the world of the microscopic once again. And we're going to be exploring a topic that we can't even see with the unaided eye. We need a microscope in order to see these critters that are all around us. What is it that I am referring to? Well, I am referring to this week's topic, protests. And so this week, we're going to be learning all about these little critters, these protests. And as we do, let me just remind you that we are exploring the five kingdom system of organisms on planet Earth. Last week, if you recall, we were learning about Kingdom Monera, the Monerans made up of the bacteria. That was our first kingdom that we began exploring last week. And so this week, we're beginning to explore the second kingdom of organisms known as Kingdom Protista, or the Protists. These first two kingdoms were, were unknown thousands of years ago, even hundreds of years ago, until the advent of microscopic technology that enabled us to peer into the universe of the unseen, things smaller than the human eye can detect by itself. So, without further ado, why don't we begin our study of protists, these fascinating creatures, uh, some of which are shown here. We are going to have the opportunity this week to see some of these under magnification. Hopefully you enjoyed some of the funky videos from yesterday introducing this topic of protists. So what exactly are these things? Well, hopefully your books are open to the appropriate page so that we can start recording some of the information in our notes. So a protist is unicellular, meaning that it is made up of one cell or a single celled organism with a nucleus. So right here, as you're writing this description of a protist, we see the distinction or the difference from last week's topic on Kingdom Monarin, or the bacteria, because if you recall from last week, the bacteria, they don't have a nucleus. So one of the characteristics that distinguishes the difference between bacteria and protists is that protists do have a nucleus. Now, there are other differences, as we will discover this week. I think protists are pretty fascinating. I can't wait for our lab activity so that we can get a close-up view of some of these funky-looking protists, these unicellular organisms that do contain a nucleus. But as you can probably already imagine... Not all protists are the same. In fact, we are going to be discussing this week three different types of protists. Scientists, as you know, love to classify and organize living things. And in this case, life scientists, biologists have classified or grouped protists into three main types of or groups. The first one are the animal-like protists. So here's my first question to you. Think long and hard about this question. Here it is. What do you think animal-like protists are like? Did you say animals? <laughs> well, you're exactly right. And we'll elaborate on that as we go through this topic. The second group of protists are called the plant-like protists. Here's my next question to you. What do you think plant-like protists are like? 
Did you say plants? <laughs> well, if you did, you're absolutely right. Yes, plant-like protists share some similar characteristics and features as plants do. And now that brings us to the third type of protists. The third type of protists are fungus-like protists. So here's my next question. What do you think fungus-like protists are like? Hmm. Did you say fungus? Oh. Uh. Well, unfortunately, you're right. Yes, fungus-like protists are like fungus. And what exactly does that mean? Well, stay tuned and we will find out probably tomorrow what fungus-like protists are like and in what ways are they like fungus. But let's begin with the animal-like protists first. Animal-like protists are also called protozoa. In fact, uh, if you think back to the topic we spent learning about the microscope, you may recall the scientist of the week that week, Antoine van Leeuwenhoek. Leeuwenhoek was, became famous for his, uh, his book Micrographia, I think it was called, where he explained the whole new world of the microscopic viewed under his improved upon microscope. And he viewed things that he called animacules, if you remember. And he called them such because uh, they, they actually moved around like animals move around. He was the first one, really, to observe these. Well, we have a more specific name for them uh, today, as opposed to animacules. We call them protozoa. But they're the same things that Van Leeuwenhoek viewed under his microscope. So let's pick apart this word. Let's dissect it. If we look at the second part first... Z-O-A comes from the same Greek root word we get the word Z-O-O -O from. And what do you find a lot of in Z-O-O's? Animals. Yeah, Zoa refers to animal. Now, what about the prefix proto? Can you think of any other words that begin with proto? Maybe you came up with a prototype, the first of its kind. Maybe you remember back to last year when you learned about proto-stars and proto-planets and the proto-sun, the, the beginning of something, the first of its kind. Well, proto does mean first. And so the word protozoa literally means the first animal. Now, many biologists believe that the first animals that appeared on planet Earth were protozoas, the first animals that were unicellular organisms with a nucleus. And, uh, and so you'll hear that in the field of biology oftentimes. Well, these protozoa have certain characteristics which we are going to describe right now, beginning with uh, the characteristics that make them animal-like. So as we go through this list of characteristics, think about animals in general and what we learned earlier in the year, in the first unit, the differences between plants and animals. Maybe some of that will be familiar to you as we go through this list. Number one, Animal-like protists have cells with a nucleus. All right, that may not seem all that fabulous to you right now, but their cells have a nucleus. So this certainly distinguishes them from the Monarans of last week that didn't have nuclei. Uh, 
But uh, animal-like protists, they have a nucleus. Next characteristic, no cell wall. Now that should sound familiar to you. Again, back in the first unit, when we learned to distinguish between plant cells and animal cells, this was one of the main characteristics we focused on at that time. Animals do not have cell walls, and nor do animal-like protists. So when we examine these on Thursday during our lab, we'll notice, uh, we'll, we'll try to take notice of, of this particular feature or characteristic that animal-like protists don't have cell walls. Another characteristic is that like animals, most animal-like protists can move around. Now, that doesn't mean they have actual legs or arms, but we will be learning about the structures that animal-like protists do have, because remember, they're only one cell big, so they're really small. Uh, I should have said one smell, one cell, one small, eh, one cell small. Uh, they don't smell. Well, maybe some of them smell, but uh, they don't actively smell like you and I smell. Although I did bathe this morning, so I don't, I don't think I really smell. But I have the capacity to smell, to determine smell. All right, I'm digressing. Let's get back to the topic. Most animal-like protists can move, and we will learn about the various modes and means of locomotion as they go from one place to another. Here's another characteristic of animal-like protists. They are heterotrophs. And uh, last week, you learned the difference between an autotroph and a heterotroph. So who can tell me what a heterotroph is? If you said a heterotroph can't make its own food, you're absolutely right. Remember the prefix hetero means different, troph means feeding. So different feeding implies that these organisms have to find their food from a different source, not from sunlight. They're not photosynthetic. They're not autotrophs. And we'll get into that with the next type or group of protists, if you know what I mean. So they are heterotrophic, meaning they can't make their own food. So in this big category of animal-like protists, they're not all the same. There's a lot of variety of animal-like protists. So let's talk about some of those Varieties. In fact, scientists, again, love to group things, and they've come up with four groups, four different groups of animal-like protists. So let's start talking about the four main groups of animal-like protists, beginning with the first one, the sarcodines. Look at the word. Notice its spelling as you're writing it down. And I'd like you to say it out loud. Even if you're by yourself, say it out loud. Each of these words, say them out loud as you are writing them down. Sarcodyne, the sarcodynes. Because we're going to come across some pretty funky words here as we go through this particular topic. So the first group of animal-like protists are the sarcodynes. The next group are the ciliates. The ciliates. The first C, sound, well, the only C sounds like an S. The ciliates. And we'll see why the ciliates are called the ciliates when we get to this group in a little while. The third group are the zooflagellates. You probably already have an idea of the prefix here, zoo, it, it probably makes sense that they are an animal-like protist. You know what I mean? Zooflagellates. And in a little while, you'll know why we call these zooflagellates. Now, when you say flagellate, make sure you don't confuse it with the word flatulence. 
We're not talking about flatulence or flatus here. We're talking about flagellates. There is a big difference. Maybe I'll give you a bonus point if you can tell me what the difference is between flagellate and flatulence. All right, the next group are the sporozoans. Take a notice of the word here, Z-O-A, very similar to the zoo, which is why they fit into the animal-like protus so well. The sporozoans. So we've got the sarcodines, the ciliates, the zooflagellates, and the sporozoans. Before we go on to the next slide, just refresh your memory and read each one of those words so that you can pronounce them correctly. Sarcodyne, ciliates, zooflagellates, and the sporozoans. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to unpack each one of these groups and learn a little bit more about each one. So let's begin with the sarcodines. The sarcodines have a pseudopod. Oh my goodness, all of these weird words. What are you doing to me, Mr. Skirps? I'm exercising your brain. That's what I'm doing. And again, if we learn some basic prefixes and suffixes, our understanding of some of these funky words will be easier for us to grasp. So let's just look at the word pseudopod. Pseudopod. Now, I'll ask you some questions. Have any of you ever heard of Mark Twain? He's the author who wrote Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, uh, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, uh, and, and the list goes on and on and on and on. He's a very famous author from the 19th century. But Mark Twain wasn't his real name. That's not what he was born with. He was actually born with the name Samuel Langhorn Clemens. Now, with a name like that, you might want to come up with a fake name to write with. And that's what he did. He came up with a fake name. Now, a fake name for authors is called a pseudonym. NIM, N-Y-M, refers to a name. You know that from our topic on classification. But, <clears throat> excuse me, but this, <clears throat> ah, <clears throat> oh, I swallowed something down the wrong throat. <sighs> All right, I'm better. What about the prefix pseudo? Well, I just told you that a pseudonym is a false name. What do you think the prefix pseudo <clears throat> actually means? If you said false, then you, that's true. You, you got the answer right. Pseudo means false. That is true. Now, you may have heard it in other contexts. I'm sure you can think of famous uh, singers or stars of some kind that go by a name that isn't really their name, not that they were born with it. Uh, they, some people call them stage names. Technically, they are pseudonyms or false names. All right, so pseudo means false. What about pod? Hmm. Have any of you ever taken pictures? You use a camera to take pictures. And if you want to keep a camera real steady while taking a picture, you might use something to attach your camera to that has three legs. Does anybody know what that's called? It's called a tripod. Tripod. Now, I'm sure you know what the prefix tri means, right? Not one, not two, but three. Three. Tri means three, but pod. Now, if you think it means leg, you're pretty close. But I'm going to give you another hint. 
What's at the end of your leg? The other end, the bottom end of your leg. Your foot. Pod means foot. So what do you think a pseudopod literally means? It literally means false foot. And the sarcodines use these pseudopods, these false feet, to move and to hunt around. Uh, this is their means of locomotion and their means of hunting to acquire food. These pseudopods or false feet. Here's an example of a sarcodyne, and it's probably the most famous protist, uh, and it is called the amoeba. Now, if you notice the spelling of amoeba, you will see various alternate spellings of the word amoeba. Don't be confused. There are actually several different ways to spell amoeba. This is, I think, the easiest one. But an amoeba is a blob-like sarcodyne. Now, back in, I think, the 1950s, there were a lot of B-rated science fiction movies that came out that were, uh, they were really bad special effects, but interesting storylines and but bad acting. And some of them have become famous because they were just so kind of outlandish. One of them was called The Blob. I remember watching The Blob when I was a kid. And as a kid, I was like, oh my goodness, this blob. It's like taking over the city here. It's crazy. And The Blob, was like a giant amoeba, and it was devouring the whole town, but it moved so slow, you could easily walk away from it, and yet everybody was running away from the blob in, in fear. It was kind of funny. I think the end of the story was the big helicopter came and picked up this blob and brought it up to the North Pole so it would freeze. Oh, no. I wonder if with global warming, the blob might actually melt from the North Pole and come back down and terrorize us once again. Oh boy, I might have to watch that movie again so I can have a, a way of, uh, of combating the blob if it ever returns. But uh, an amoeba, an example of a sarcodyne with pseudopods. And in this picture here, all of these bulging undularities uh, move. And you'll see a video of uh, amoeba moving using their pseudopods. If we were together in the lab, I would teach you a new dance step called the sarcodyne shuffle. When your pseudopods would ooze and pull, ooze and pull, ooze and pull, ooze and pull. And that's how sarcodynes get around. Their pseudopods ooze and pull in all directions or in the direction they want to move. So that's how they get around. And it's also how they engulf their, their prey to consume them. So sarcodynes. Another example of sarcodynes are kind of cool. They are called foraminiferins. As you're writing that down, say it three times real fast. Foraminiferins, foraminiferins, foraminiferins. For, am, in, if, or ins. It's actually pretty easy. All little words put together. For, am, in, if, or ins. Foraminiferins. Foraminiferins, foramenifer now I have trouble saying it, foraminiferins are actually pretty cool. I mean, look at this picture for a moment. And in this picture, you will see uh, some specimens of foraminiferins. Foraminiferins are, are organisms, one-celled organisms that are encased in a shell. But if you've ever gone to the seashore, like Sally went to the seashore to sell seashells, 
Say that three times real fast. Sally sells seashells at the seashore. That's a tongue twister. Anyway, you know, if you think of a typical seashell, they're, they're pretty big. You can hold them in your hand. Some of them are, you know, absolutely beautiful. But they're certainly multicellular. Here, all of these shells are only one cell large. And look at the detail on them. I think it's absolutely phenomenal that one-celled organisms can create these intricate shell patterns that, uh, that, that certainly compare and compete with, with the multicellular shells you might find at the seashore. I think they're absolutely wild. All right, let's get into the next group here. The next group are the ciliates. The ciliates. Now, the ciliates have cilia. What are cilia? Well, cilia are tiny hair-like structures. Now, if you look at my hair, I have very short hair. And I have lots of it, by the way. Lots of short hair. Uh, and with my short hair, you can see it's all kind of like little spiker doodles, as my one daughter would say when she was much younger. But these little spiker doodles uh, kind of all stand out when they're really, really short. Well, that's how ciliates are. Ciliates have little tiny hair-like structures called cilia that all kind of poke out like this. And they move around. In fact, cilia are used by the ciliates to move, uh, typically in an aquatic environment, but like oars or paddles. Like if you've ever gone canoeing or kayaking or rowboating, think of an oar or a paddle in the water moving you around from one place to another. Well, that's how cilia get from one place to another. Uh, and so ciliates use cilia. So now you know why ciliates are called ciliates. It's because they're made up of lots and lots of cilia. And maybe one way, this is how I remember what cilia are. I'm going to ask you to do something. Are you ready? So even though you're watching me on a screen, I want you to do this anyway. Put your hands behind your back like this, okay, and with your fingers up above your head and move your fingers around like this as you sway back and forth. No, no, I want you to do it. Don't hesitate. Don't, don't worry about how silly you might look, but take your fingers like this behind your head and move them around. Do you think I look silly? I think I look silly with my make-believe cilia behind my head. That's how I remember what ciliates are. Ciliates have cilia, and I look silly when I try to pretend to be a ciliate. All right. Uh, uh, I'm probably embarrassing myself by doing that. So let me give you an example of a real ciliate, not a fake one. A real one is a paramecium. Maybe you've even heard of these crittier, critters before. A paramecium, very famous example. You'll see videos, if you haven't already seen the video, of paramecium squirming around and engulfing their prey with their, with their gullet. Uh, they, they, they're good hunters, by the way. So here we have the ciliates. All right, next group are the zooflagellates. Zooflagellates. Again, zoo refers to animal. Makes sense. But what about flagellates? Well, zooflagellates are called that because they have a structure on them called a flagella. And a flagella is a whip-like structure. It's a whip-like structure. Now, I think of uh, uh, when I was growing up, I, I loved watching the movie Indiana Jones and the whole series. And Indy was famous for his whip. 
and being able to do some crazy things with his whip. Well, on a microscopic scale, these zooflagellates are more talented than Indiana Jones with his whip because these zooflagellates can use their whips to move around and to capture prey as well. They are very, very talented. So if you haven't already, check out this video on zooflagellates. Now, here's an example of a zooflagellate that you don't want to meet up close and personal. It's called Giardia. Now, I don't know how many of you enjoy uh, spending time outdoors. Uh, I love the outdoors. I love hiking and canoeing and and paddling. And I, I love spending lots of time outdoors, hiking around, spending time in the woods. But if you ever get thirsty in the woods, please do not drink untreated water in the woods. Because even though the water might look clean and tasty, it might actually have some of these zooflagellates in it. You see, there are no porta potties for deer and raccoon and bears and other critters that live in the woods. And many animals do their duty when they're drinking from streams and water bodies. Uh, they let the they take the water in and they let stuff out at the same time. If you're uh, if you do spend time outdoors, you've probably noticed piles of animal droppings near water bodies. And unfortunately, sometimes their their poopies might be infected with giardia as well as some other microorganisms for that matter. But giardia is one in particular that. Uh, can find its way into a water source. And if it finds its way into your belly because you've drank untreated water, believe me, you will be suffering from a condition caused by this giardia. And you could literally die from it uh, if untreated. And the condition is diarrhea. Yes, diarrhea can kill you called dysentery. If you have uncontrolled diarrhea, you will eventually both dehydrate and starve to death. Uh, bad combination. So don't drink the untreated water and ingest some giardia. That would be bad. But unfortunately, there are tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people that die around the world every year from diarrhea. Uh, thankfully, not many of them are in the United States. All right. The next group are the sporozoans. The sporozoans are parasites. Parasites that require a host. And uh, probably the most famous sporozoan is the plasmodium. To me, it looks like a musical, uh, what would that be, an eighth note or a quarter note? Uh, or it could be a saxophone, a saxophone, like, you know, playing a saxophone. Uh, it's it's kind of cool. But you really don't want to get this critter inside of you either. This is, I believe, the biggest killer uh, in the world. This plasmodium is what causes Malaria. Do some research on malaria and you'll see just how bad it is. Uh, now, the malaria, this plasmodium, the malaria caused the plasma, the, the malaria causing plasmodium is transmitted through this critter, the mosquito. And if you get bit by an infected mosquito, uh, it can create liver damage, uh, destroy your red blood cells, uh, and cause your skin to turn yellow, which is why historically malaria used to be called yellow fever because your skin would turn yellow and you'd run a really nasty high fever before you died from liver damage from all your ruptured red blood cells. 
not a nice way to go. So on that lovely happy note, how about we call it quits for today and we'll save the rest for tomorrow. So stay away from mosquitoes and untreated water so that you don't get infected by these little one-celled critters called protists. Bye-bye.